not here to be licked or chewed. Sir, no, sir! You are here to be eaten with honor. It's a quiet Saturday night in 2003. 11 year old me is channel surfing way past his bedtime and all of a sudden this scene lights up our little CRT screen. It's this crazy action sequence taking place on a seemingly never ending bridge. Turns out it's from this movie called True Lies. I remember thinking, holy cow, this is awesome. And how? 19 years later, and these mid-90s action sequences have aged pretty poor, right? To the point where the how is now pretty damn obvious, right? Right? May I see your invitation, please? Sure. Here's my invitation. Explosions. Top floor, please. A horse in an elevator. Uh, this scene. And um, this insane bridge sequence. How does a movie that came out when actors wore Hawaiian shirts with beige blazers still look this good? And how the heck did they blow a giant hole in uh, Florida's Seven Mile Bridge? How how they do that? Well, um, let's pop the tape in and find out. Okay, so at this point in the scene, a pair of Harrier jump jets have arrived on location, right, to try and stop this nuclear bomb from reaching the shores of Florida. Let's get some. At first glance, there doesn't seem to be anything too spectacular about this moment. I mean, compared to all the craziness that had come before it. But the closer I look, the more insane I feel. Why? Because. risk of stating the obvious, this Harrier jet isn't actually firing anything. Instead, what we're watching is just some truly well-timed pyrotechnics. In fact, it's not just the pyro that's well-timed. This eight-second moment is full of expert timing, made even more impressive when you begin to consider all the moving parts involved in these few quick shots. Just the fact that the pyrotechnics for the bullet impacts in the water match up perfectly with the truck explosion is enough to make your mind melt. Even before you consider the fact that if any of these moving parts are even a fraction off their mark, the magic of the shot is ruined. The truck isn't in the right spot, the jet covers the pyrotechnics, or the helicam is just too far away. It's bonkers. Bonkers enough for me to think that this might just be computer generated. I mean, they did that exact thing the very next scene, so it'd make sense. I honestly thought I was right until I spotted something. See that little speck on the other bridge? Well, that's a camera operator. How do I know this little speck is a camera operator? Well, because he's filming the very next shot the film cuts to. And it's this second angle that totally gives it away. This is all in camera.
Uh, which brings us to this shot. That's a real life-sized explosion. And that's a real stuntman. Sitting in the driver's seat mere millimeters away from that cascade of fire. Well, uh, actually, they probably had to take the seat out now that I um, think about it because, you know, to make room for his giant. So, CGI. Wait, don't fast forward. Okay. I, I just want to know one thing. Who actually thought that this was computer generated? Because uh, I didn't uh, for 20 years. The fact that I never really suspected that this missile would be something they just added in post goes to show how well James Cameron and the team at Digital Domain integrated computer generated imagery with practical in camera elements. A theme that will become painfully clear as we continue to break down this scene. Speaking of um, breaking things down. Hey Marines, it's time to kick ass. I recommend using your Mavericks to take out the bridge. Roger that. Line flight switch Mavericks. Two. Hey, these missiles won't set off those nukes, will they? Negative. That's a negative flight zero one. So, okay, it, it's a miniature. And for those that already um, guessed that. Now, although the visual effects for True Lies were handled by John Bruno and the team at Digital Domain, the construction of the miniature Seven Mile Bridge was actually outsourced to Mark Stetson's Stetson Visual Services, whose miniature work you might recall from such movies as Edward Scissorhands, Total Recall, and The Fifth Element, just to name a few. Two incredibly talented fellows named Leslie Ecker and Richard Stutzman were then tasked with the design, construction, and eventual obliteration of the mini Seven Mile Bridge. And what they were able to achieve was nothing short of an engineering masterclass. The miniature was primarily made out of plaster, moulded in sections that were supported by these steel pads with channels of surgical tubing built into the plaster for the explodey pyrotechnics. When all was said and done, the bridge was around one and a half metres wide, about three metres tall, and around a hundred metres long. So probably not as miniature as you would have thought. It had to be built here in Los Angeles, all the pieces, loaded onto a truck, driven across the country, parked on a field in the Keys next to a pier, taken out of the truck and put on the ground, loaded onto a dolly, loaded onto a boat, and then motored out to the miniature location, and then loaded onto the tower bases that were anchored to the coral um, without breaking. We were out there all day, nine hours in water, about this deep just deep enough to be a pain in the ass. So uh, it took a while to build, but we got it built really well, and we got two takes, both of them perfect. Well, mostly perfect. And uh, that's what you see in the film. The most impressive aspect of this miniature endeavor for me is the fact that its destruction had to match the full-size aftermath that had already been shot in Florida. This meant the mini bridge had to collapse and fall in a very deliberate fashion so they matched the life size shots that followed in the film. I mean, the route the truck takes into the air here by the exploding bridge platform underneath it was no accident. It was meticulously by design. 
the truck itself is what triggered the pyrotechnics because the timing had to be absolutely precise. The pyro had to go off and the truck is in exactly one place and no other. And so if you look at the film, you can see what happens and it's exactly what I thought was gonna happen where the, the slab was floating up and the truck hits it and goes up and does kind of a backflip and then lands on its side, I think. And I had the truck made with a, a very flexible framework on the box because I figured it would land hard and I wanted to see it deform in just the right way so it would have scale, but not come apart. But also there's a nuclear bomb inside a case inside this thing. So just in case it came apart, we made a nuclear bomb case that was a miniature that was indestructible. So it could be seen spilling out of the truck just in case. Never needed it because the truck held together, but you can see the whole framework of the truck sort of twisting in just the right way when it hits the ground. And that's because we engineered it to do that precisely. Just pure genius by Leslie Ecker and his uber talented crew. Oh. And this gentleman named uh, Joe Viscosal, who really loved blowing things up. But wait, hold up, Paul. Why did this have to match this? Why is there a giant hole in the real bridge if they only blew up the miniature? There's a real good reason why James Cameron and co chose Florida's Seven Mile Bridge. And that's because it isn't just one bridge, it's two. <laughs> but for this to make sense, we've got to go right back to the very start of the sequence. When the scene begins at the hour 52 mark, we actually get given a very clear aerial shot of our two bridge situation with the new on the right and the old on the left. Now, as this scene plays out, keep an eye on the barriers. Just remember, the old has these reused railroad tracks as barriers and the other, solid concrete. So, Helen's cozied up in this limo as Tia Carrere's Juno breaks out some champagne. What do they say about celebrating too early again? So we get some kind of obvious reprojection work that was shot on a stage for these shots in the car, but nevertheless, you can see that they're still on the new Seven Mile Bridge. The film then cuts to Arnie and Tom Arnold's characters following the action from above. At first, I thought this was also shot on a stage, but then they pan. Damn, okay. Those are some real Harrier jets, which weren't cheap either, by the way. Around two and a half thousand dollars an hour to put a number on. What's really interesting is that they did shoot some of these helicopter shots on a stage. And when you put them next to the location footage, they actually hold up pretty damn well. Also, uh, just a side note, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but um, is this pilot not James Cameron? Roger that. Line flight switch mavericks. Two. Hey, missiles won't set off those nukes, will they? It's, it can be more work, but I find it to be getting easier and easier and more intuitive. Hey, missiles won't set off those nukes, will they? To be getting easier and easier and more intuitive. Because anyway, the scene cuts once more and we're back at the limo. Notice anything? Those aren't solid concrete barriers. So just like that, within a few cuts, we find ourselves now speeding along the old Seven Mile Bridge. And James Cameron will keep us there for the rest of the scene. But why? Why switch bridges? Well... Looks like it's uh, time for a little history lesson. See, in the days when the OG Seven Mile Bridge was still in use, it had one of these. They're called a swing span. Basically a section of the bridge that rotates to allow taller boats to pass through. But when they built the new and improved Seven Mile, they simply elevated a section of the same channel of water and thus the old, clunky and expensive to maintain swing span was 
removed. The result was this, a giant 80 metre gap in the old bridge. So for James Cameron, the mission was simple. Blow up the bridge in miniature form and then simply cut to the real section of the bridge with the missing swing span for everything after the explosion. You set dress the shallow waters with some collapsed faux concrete platforms and boom, you have yourself an on location set of a bridge that looks like it has a giant hole in it. Because it does. Which brings us perfectly to the finale, the piste resistance. I'm just gonna fast forward through this, but you're not missing much. It's just Arnie basically going. Uh, you, you know what he does. I'm just gonna press play. So you've got Arnie's stunt double leaning Captain America style from a helicopter, holding onto the insanely talented stunt woman in Donna Keegan, as the limousine literally plummets off the edge of the bridge beneath them, leaving these two brave souls just hanging out. And it's all in camera. What makes this even better is the fact that Jamie Lee Curtis did a lot of this stunt herself. Seriously, that's her sticking her head out of a speeding limo on location. And this shot, all Jamie. That's her wired up to the helicopter. And uh, the cameraman, James Cameron himself. I mean, what an ending to a movie. If it was the end, that is, because it's not. No, the finale of the movie sees Harry fighting a terrorist with a Harrier jet. But surely this was shot on a stage. Well, yes. But also, no. The shots like these from the side or below the jet, the production actually fixed a model to the top of a skyscraper. I'm deadly serious. The model was connected to the skyscraper by this hydraulic articulating arm system that allowed them to replicate specific movements over and over with absolute precision. Then for shots like these from above, they dangled the jet off the side of said building with a giant yellow crane that was cleverly incorporated into the scene itself. Then they just removed the wire supports in post. And when it's all cut together, it looks incredible. But um, despite me not wanting to believe it, the 90s were actually a very long time ago. Gone are the days of True Lies' on location action sequences shot almost entirely in camera. We're just in a different era now, you know? Films just aren't made that way anymore. Eh. I wouldn't be so sure.
us. It's an inorganic <laughs> plasmic discharge. It's from the device, not from my body. It smells. Yeah, it does. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Don't pull up the magazine. You're probably feeling coolness. And you know, that's not to say CGI heavy action sequences can't be brilliant or that perhaps every action scene is financially possible without CGI. It's just that these movies, these moments seem to have a real habit of sticking with you, you know, and, and leaving you with that indescribable heart pumping feeling when it all comes to an end and you just wanna 